A Double-Barreled Detective Story by Mark Twain Part 2 Chapter 3 The tavern dining room had been cleared of all its furniture, save one six-foot pine table and a chair. This table was against one end of the room. The chair was on it, Sherlock Holmes, stately, imposing, impressive, sat in the chair. The public stood. The room was full. The tobacco smoke was dense, the stillness profound. The extraordinary man raised his hand to command additional silence, held it in the air a few moments, then, in brief, crisp terms, he put forward question after question and noted the answers with mm-hmms, nods of the head, and so on. By this process, he learned all about Flint Buckner, his character, conduct and habits that the people were able to tell him. It thus transpired that the extraordinary man's nephew was the only person in the camp who had a killing grudge against Flint Buckner. Mr. Holmes smiled compassionately upon the witness and asked, languidly. Do any of you gentlemen chance to know where the lad Fatlock Jones was at the time of the explosion? A thunderous response followed. In the billiard room of this house! Ah! And had he just come in? Been there all of an hour! Ah! It is about, about, well, about how far might it be to the scene of the explosion? All of a mile, ah! It isn't much of an alibi, it is true, but a storm burst of laughter mingled with shouts of, By Jiminy, but he's chain lightning, and ain't you sorry you spoke, Sandy? shut off the rest of the sentence, and the crushed witness drooped his blushing face in pathetic shame. The inquisitor resumed. The lad Jones's somewhat distant connection with the case, laughter, having been disposed of, let us now call the eye-witnesses of the tragedy and listen to what they have to say. He got out his fragmentary clues and arranged them on a sheet of cardboard on his knee. The house held its breath and watched. We have the longitude and the latitude corrected for magnetic variation, and this gives us the exact location of the tragedy. We have the altitude, the temperature, and the degree of humidity prevailing, inestimably valuable, since they enable us to estimate with precision the degree of influence which they would exercise upon the mood and disposition of the assassin at that time of the night. Buzz of admiration. Muttered remark, By George, but he's deep! He fingered his clues. And now, let us ask these mute witnesses to speak to us. Here, we have an empty linen shot back. What is its message? This, that robbery was the motive, not revenge. What is its further message? This, that the assassin was of inferior intelligence, shall we say, light-witted, or perhaps approaching that? How do we know this? Because a person of sound intelligence would not have proposed to rob the man Buckner, who never had much money with him. But the assassin might have been a stranger. Let 
the bag speak again. I take from it this article. It is a bit of silver bearing quartz. It is peculiar. Examine it, please, you. And you? And you? Now, pass it back, please. There is but one load on this coast which produces just that character and color of quartz. And that is a load which crops out for nearly two miles on a stretch and, in my opinion, is destined at no distant day to confer upon its locality a globe-girdling celebrity and upon its two hundred owners riches beyond the dreams of avarice. Name that load, please. The Consolidated Christian Science and Marianne, was the prompt response. A wild crash of hurrahs followed, and every man reached for his neighbor's hand and wrung it with tears in his eyes, and Wells Fargo Ferguson shouted, The straight flush is on the load, and up she goes to a hunched and fifty a foot, you hear me? When quiet fell, Mr. Holmes resumed. We perceive then that three facts are established, to wit. The assassin was approximately light-witted. He was not a stranger. His motive was robbery, not revenge. Let us proceed. I hold in my hand a small fragment of fuse with the recent smell of fire upon it. What is its testimony? Taken with the corroborative evidence of the quartz, it reveals to us that the assassin was a miner. What does it tell us further? This, gentleman, that the assassination was consummated by means of an explosive. What else does it say? This, that the explosive was located against the side of the cabin nearest the road, the front side, for within six feet of that spot I found it. I hold in my fingers a burnt Swedish match, the kind one rubs on a safety box. I found it in the road, 622 feet from the abolished cabin. What does it say? This, that the train was fired from that point. What further does it tell us? This, that the assassin was left-handed. How do I know this? I should not be able to explain to you, gentlemen, how I know it, the signs being so subtle that only long experience and deep study can enable one to detect them. But the signs are there, and they are reinforced by a fact, which you must have often noticed in the great detective narratives, that all assassins are left-handed. By Jackson, that's so said Ham Sandwich, bringing his great hand down with a resounding slap upon his thigh. Blamed if I ever thought of it before. Nor I, nor I, cried several. Oh, there can't anything escape him. Look at his eye. Gentlemen, distant as the murderer was from his doomed victim, he did not wholly escape injury. This fragment of wood which I now exhibit to you, struck him. It drew blood. Wherever he is, he bears the tell-tale mark. I picked it up where he stood when he fired the fatal train. He looked out over the house from his high perch, and his countenance began to darken. He slowly raised his hand and pointed there stands the assassin. And I think I'll stop for today. And we're going to find out who, according to Sherlock Holmes, the assassin is the next time. Bye-bye.